Thank you, and once again, welcome to the Theological Seminar of the Air. We trust that if you're a student of the Word of God or a teacher of the Word of God, you'll have an interest and concern about the broadcast and be able to sit down for a while and take some notes and share with us many of the great truths of God's Word that deal with the doctrinal content of the Holy Bible. Our lesson for the next two periods deals with the dubious subject of evolution. And we go into this because we're studying anthropology now in our systematic theology studies. Having studied theology and Christology and pneumatology, our next sub- subject properly is anthropology and, of course, the relative subjects, which are homotheology, dealing with the uh, matter of the sinfulness of man, and angelology and demonology, dealing with the effort of Satan and his angels and his cohorts to overthrow man. This will lead eventually to the great doctrines of soteriology, the doctrines of salvation. But today we're discussing the matter of evolution, as evolution is the main lie taught in the public school system to overthrow the Genesis account and the truth of the Word of God. Now, evolution is not only taught as a possible theory, but it is taught as a fact in nearly every state university in America. Maynard Shipley, head of the Science League of America, says, quote, Scientists the world over accept the general theory of evolution as valid and incontrovertible and regard the process of evolution as a fact. Linville Kelly and Cleve in their textbook General Zoology write, quote, All scientists of the present time agree that evolution is a fact. Now, of course, that's a lie. For example, Dr. Arthur L. Brown, a noted uh, scientist and, chemi- and chemist, said, <clears throat> evolution as a theory has utterly collapsed from the weight of its own inherent absurdities and impossibilities. So we have two divisions of scientists today divided in, the, in opposite camps. One group of scientists think that evolution is absurd and impossible and nonsense. The other bit, bunch think it is a fact. Rather wide gap. Somebody must be uh, fooling themselves pretty badly. Of course, evolution is the religion of the communist. Every communist and sociologist listening to my voice has a religion. Your religion is evolution. You believe in man. You believe in man's ability to overcome man so that man may arrive at where man is man and man is man. That is to you, man is God. Every communist has a religion and his religion is evolution. And he has doctrinal convictions about this fantastic hallucination as much as any Trappist monastery has about a Hail Mary or an Our Father. And when it comes to sacred cows, don't you think that the Catholics have a monopoly on all of them, or the Baptists have a monopoly on them, or that the uh, Satanists or phrenologists or palmists or tea leaf readers have a monopoly? The sacred cows of American education could fill the pastures of Wyoming. Uh, to them, such things as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny and vestigial organs of embryonic recapitulation and the making of uh, clones and clowns and clowns and computerized mechanics and artificial insemination are gods to these clowns. Evolution defined. A concise definition is given by Herbert Spencer, a great deluded sinner, who said evolution is always fundamentally an integration of matter and dissipation of motion. He also said, quote, evolution is an integration of matter and a concomitant dissipation of motion during which the matter passes from an indefinite, incoherent homogeneity to a definite, coherent heterogeneity and during which the retained motion undergoes a parallel transformation. Mr. Spencer simply meant that the process of nature is always from the simple to the complex and from the complex to the more complex. Of course, that is renounced and refuted by every fact known to modern science. But Herbert Spencer still still persisted in the Disneyland type of scholarship. Disneyland uh, scholarship says that this is true of both plants, animals, and humans. The process was from non-living matter to plants, to animals, then humans. Briefly, evolution is the gradual development of no life in the life and then higher forms of life from lower stages of living matter. This theory seeks to explain the universe from a primitive nebulosity to a modern world. That is, it is an opium pipe dream which denies the first three laws of thermodynamics established by physicists. 
does give us the first real clue as to what an evolutionist is. He is a fairy tale philosopher, and that's why he leaves physics out and draw these funny little charts, you know, with little diagrams on them about the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic, the Oligocene, the Pliocene, all that stuff. You know, for the kiddies in the universities. The claims of evolution. Now, don't talk about equal time. Any professor has already taken more time in class making a lie out of God to put this fairy tale across than any radio preacher has taken the last 400 years. Don't give me that stuff. Why, the TV just put on a nationwide network thing a couple of years back, running two hours to teach evolution as a fact, and when they got through, not one Bible-believing scientist in the world was given 14 seconds to answer. Equal time, your Aunt Sally's house cat. Now, the claims of evolution, it claims to include in its scope every atom of matter, and even the most infinitesimal living matter. It claims to include every living minute of minute of time, past, present, and future. It flatly rejects all of the theories of explanation of the world and universe. It flatly rejects the biblical account, and it flatly says Jesus Christ was a liar because he said that God from the beginning of the creation made a man male and female. It emphasizes continuity, but recognizes secondary causes like natural selection, heredity, adaptation to environment, physiological selection, a natural struggle for life, and the survival of the fittest. Now, there are many missing links in the theory of evolution. As a matter of fact, there are so many we couldn't list them on this broadcast. In the first place, they cannot explain erratic boulders. Erratic boulders were supposed to have been dragged down from the North Pole to Canada and North Dakota and Ohio and Kansas by a glacier that had to move up over Mount McKinley starting from sea level. Of this type of scholarship, we may say it is fantastic absurdity. Glaciers never start at levels below 6,000 feet above sea level, and they do not move up mountains that are 10,000 feet high. That can be demonstrated with empirical scientific fact. The modern evolutionists cannot explain ociferous tissue, uh, fissures. Ociferous fissures are cracks or rents or crevices in the Earth's surface and high elevations in which have been found the bones of dinosaurs, camels, rhinoceri, men, monkeys, sheep, cows and horses all together in one common grave. The evolutionists cannot explain the theory of orogenesis, mountain forming, the ridiculous fantastic nonsense that the mountains were formed by sedimentary deposit of rains washing down granite, in this case igneous rock that came up from volcanoes below, would require more rain than it would take for Noah's flood to reach Mount Everest. Hence the polar caps and glacial claps and orogenesis have never been explained satisfactorily by any evolutionist. Furthermore, the evolutionist fails to account for the first atom. Where did the first atom come from? It fails to explain how the original matter changed from homogenous to a moving one. It cannot explain how the present universe is a cosmos and not a chaos. Anybody who knows that the random entropy in the closed system, according to the second law of thermodynamics, tends toward disorganization, not organization. Anybody knows that but an evolutionist. That's why all communist countries go into revolution and chaos and have to accept a dictatorship to keep them together. All communist countries are run by a dictatorship of between one and ten men. Otherwise, it'd be chaos. Why, who doesn't know that if you take up 35 pieces of cardboard a foot square with one letter in each one of them and fly over the Alps and drop them, that they'll not land on one rooftop and spell out a sentence. And the more times you try, the less chance you'll have of ever doing it. The chances increase with the time. 
and the silly evolutionists of the 19th and 20th century who allowed these 20 million, 80 million, 100 million span in their chronology forgot the second law of thermodynamics. If the earth had been here for even 20 million years, it would have fallen apart at least 5 million years ago. So we see the ridiculous nonsense uh, propagated by this cult of uh, radical extremist fanatics is accepted in colleges as truth when it's talking about the hallucination of a pipe dream. Evolutionists cannot explain continuity. How does a horse produce a horse and not an evoluted specimen? They can't explain how life came from non-living original atoms. There's any way in the world anybody in a laboratory has produced living matter from non-living matter unless they experimented with it. Why, the experimenter would be God. Can't you figure that out? If they ever produced in a, in a laboratory living matter from non-living matter, they would prove there was a God because somebody had to mess with it. The evolutionist cannot explain the introduction of animal sensation and consciousness. He can't explain the leap from the animal world to that of man. They will eventually explain it by talking about relationship between men and beasts, which is called bestiality in sex education. Now, this means that eventually your college professor will return to what we call Baal and Ashtoreth worship, which is the primal scream of bestiality warned against in the book of Leviticus. The only way to eventually explain the leap from man to animal in the evolutionary system is obviously the logical leap. Two and two is four. The evolutionist cannot explain the present distribution of matter on numerous stars and planets. He can't explain the asteroid belt where a planet is missing. He can't explain that the fact that some of the moons and some of the planets rotate in the wrong direction. And he can't explain the changes from psychic, social, and moral, and spiritual realms that take place. Now, some dogmatists hold the theory regardless of arguments presented against it. These bigoted dogmatists, these narrow-minded mid-Victorian prudes, make up 80% of the faculty of every state university in America. Some hold evolution as a hypothesis possessing a high degree of probability. That will take care of 15 more percent. The marks of a legitimate hypothesis in science are one, it must not be inconsistent with facts already established as scientific. For example, the first three laws of thermodynamics. Two, it must be capable of verification or disproof by subsequent investigations. How are you going to verify the origin of man? Three, it must be applicable to the description or explanation of phenomena, and if it is not, if it is, it must assign a cause fully adequate to have produced them. Evolution violates the first one, it's not consistent with the facts, and it violates the third one, it is not applicable to the description or explanation of phenomena, and it cannot assign a cause fully adequate to have produced them. Some accept evolution in a modified form, theistic evolution. Evangelicals reject the theory and accept the Bible account of creation as scientific and the hallucination of the faculty members of the NEA as pure, unadulterated nonsense. Now, the truth of any doctrine can often be judged best of all by the result of its application in human thought and experience. Christ said, By their fruits you shall know them. What are the fruits of evolution? Professor S. J. Holmes of the University of California has said, Darwinianism, consistently applied, would measure goodness in terms of survival value. According to this doctrine, the survival of the individual is therefore the true ethical criteria of conduct, the survival of the fittest. Needless to say, this concept involves nothing original. It is the moral standard of the alley and the jungle. The doctrine of militarism, that is, the exaltation of war as an instrument of human progress, is the logical extension of the Darwinian code of ethics, from the individual to the national or racial level. The full title of Darwin's famous treatise is, quote, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Therefore, evolution has thus been the foundation stone of the modern philosophy of militarism. Exponents of militarism, such as Bernhardi and Nietzsche, have boldly claimed that from an evolutionary point of view, this was the natural law. It was therefore biologically right to crush the weaker people of the earth. Nietzsche said, quote, Man shall be trained for war and woman for the recreation of the warrior. All else is folly. Hitler repeated him, 
and both these men revolutionists, who said the whole of nature is continuous struggle between strength and weakness, and an eternal victory of the strong over the weak. Atheism. Atheism is the logical outcome of evolution in the spiritual realm, and that's why all communists in Russia and China got rid of God and accepted evolution as a religious or religion, religious teaching on religion. All communists worship evolution. It is the dialectical materialism of Marx, Lenin, and Engels, and Stalin, and what it means uh, in so many words is, man is his own savior. The late Professor H. Fairfield Osmond of Columbia University said, quote, In truth, from the period of the earliest stages of Greek thought, man has been eager to discover some natural cause of evolution and to abandon the idea of supernatural intervention in the order of nature. It is interesting to note, in passing, that as his cousin observed, Darwin was far more sympathetic with religion when his books were considered wicked by the religious world than when the dignitary of the church were eager to pay him the highest honor. Woolsey Teller, the former vice president of the Association for the Advancement of Atheism, said, The God idea cannot be reconciled with our knowledge of evolution. That if a man is a theistic evolution, <coughs> evolutionist, he is inconsistent and irrational. As D.R. Dr. R. E. D. Clark said, Charles Darwin was suffering from feeling of guilt. What was worrying him? Darwin's trouble almost certainly lay in the suppression of his religious need. His life was one long attempt to escape from Paley, to escape from the church, to escape from God. It is this that explains so much that would otherwise be incongruous in his life and character. The man who adopts evolution is trying to run from God and the Holy Spirit because he's convicted of his sins. This applies especially to Lenin, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, and any other leader who profess to be a do-gooder to atone for his wickedness. It is no exaggeration to say that as a result of the teaching of evolution, thousands of young men and women have lost their faith in Jesus Christ. As Professor James Bales of Harding College said, quote, the materialistic theory of evolution tends to break down moral law and order and to give free course to the worst passions of men. On May 1924, <clears throat> two youths, Lieb and Leopold, cruelly murdered a 14-year-old boy, Bobby Franks, by name in Chicago. At their trial the following August, these two young men were defended by the celebrated criminal lawyer, Clarence Darrow, an atheist who told a young man about to graduate from law school, if I were you and just graduating from law school, I would put an end to my life. I'd chuck it. It isn't worth it. Darrow's speech is regarded as one of the greatest judicial masterpieces in American history. Why? Because it makes you sympathetic with two murders. During the course of his remarks, Darrow said, quote, I will guarantee that you can go down to the University of Chicago today and find over a thousand volumes on Nietzsche, and I'm sure I speak moderately. If this boy is to blame for this, where did he get it? Is there any blame attached because somebody took Nietzsche's philosophy seriously and fashioned his life on it? Well, that's mighty strange. He said the biggest library on it was at the University of Chicago. Do you know who founded the University of Chicago? Bible-believing Baptist. That's where John R. Rice went when he graduated from Baylor. I guess you knew that, didn't you? The university would be more to blame than he is. The scholars of the world would be more to blame than he is. The publishers of the world and each of his books are more to blame than he is. Your Honor, it is hardly fair to hang a 90-year-old boy for the philosophy that was taught him at a university. Now, how's that? The philosophy taught at every state university in your state is evolution, the survival of the fittest. The fact that your professors don't have the guts to carry it as far as Hitler and Nietzsche carried it only shows that they're not too sincere and they're rather irrational and unstable themselves. It is frequently claimed that Darwin gave the world a great unifying concept, but it was a false concept. It is claimed Darwin took the mystery and magic out of biology, and this is also true. But he retarded the progress of science. For as Professor F. L. Marx has pointed out, the fact is that if evolutionists had not wasted a generation of hard work trying to pick up a trail which never existed, biology would at least be a generation farther along in the discovery of laws and processes which do exist. 
So Cecil G. Wakeley, formerly president of the Royal College of Surgeons in England, said, It seems such a pity in a scientific age where precision and detail are so important that the vast majority of modern scientists believe in evolution. And yet all the basic facts are against such a theory. There is nothing more non-precise and non-objective and non-factual and non-detailed as the cover cartoon Disneyland comic book charts which you people study in your books on evolution, which were drawn by professional artists. Nothing could be more non-scientific or precise. Now, we hear much of academic liberty these days, but all too often in practice this applies only the liberty of agreeing with those in authority on the subject of evolution. As Professor Henry Morris observed, quote, it is almost an impossibility for a convinced creationist to obtain or retain an influential position on a university faculty now dominated by the evolutionary concepts such as anthropology, geology, biology, psychology, and psychiatry. Professor James Bale has described this academic liberty as the new Inquisition. Professor Yaquas Barzin of Columbia University has observed that the year 1859, Darwin published his Origin of the Species, Karl Marx published his Critique of Political Economy, and Wagner published Tristan and Isolde. Darwin's book destroyed man's faith in God, Marx's book destroyed man's faith in the rights of private property, and Wagner's opera provided the cultural background which was necessary in order to make these revolutionary ideas acceptable. This was done just over a hundred years ago. There is no doubt that Darwin's book has done more to destroy man's faith in God than all the writings of the professional atheists together. For evolution has provided a materialistic concept of life that appeals to the flesh and appeals especially to the fornicator and adulterer. Similarly, Marxism, by denying the rights of private property and by promoting covetousness, has undermined the second half of the Ten Commandments, which gives us our duty toward our fellow man. As a result of Marx teaching, atheism is the state religion in communist-dominated countries today, and collectivism has replaced the family as the unit of society. This unholy alliance of materialistic Darwinism and atheistic Marxism has undermined the moral law, and this has led to chaos in the public school system, which the teachers can no longer even control in American public schools. It's led to such chaos in the government that today you're having a man named Lance thrown out of office because he overdrew his bank account when the dirty, godforsaken rascals that threw him out have overdrawn the American people's bank account to the tune of $450 billion. That's the result of college-educated politicians raised in universities. Now, isn't that something? So we talk about evolution. We're talking about something that is not merely non-biblical or non-scriptural, but something that is irrational and morally insane. And the constant propaganda that you radio listeners get in your school to the effect that all scientists believe it is outright lying which can be proved in a court of law. If you don't believe it, try me for size. There are 600 born-again, Bible-believing scientists waiting right now for some one of you people to make the first mistake. And the first time you ever try to prove in court that all qualified, accredited scientists believe in evolution, you are sure going to get a shock, honey. You are sure going to get a shock. Next week in this broadcast, I'm going to give you the list of some famous scientists who do not accept the theory of evolution. Included among these men are Dr. Albert Fleischmann, professor of zoology at the University of Erlangen, Germany, Sir John Ambrose Fleming, president of the Victoria Institute of London, Douglas Dewar, distinguished naturalist of England, Dr. Clark Vissler, curator-in-chief of the anthropological, anthropological section of the American Museum of Natural History, Dr. Austin Clark of the American Geophysical Union, an oceanographer, Dr. Gellert Miller, Dr. Professor L. T. Moore of Cincinnati University, and then just to make sure we close this thing up right, we'll take our quotations from Simpson on science, Dabonsky on science, Glass on science newsletters, Huxley on life, Ford in the evolution of life, Kreber on Ishii, the last of his tribe, Gray on nature, 
Montague on the Globe and Mail, Himmelfarb on Darwin and the Darwin Revolution, Critchley on Evolution of Man, Simpson the Meaning of Evolution, Brenneman on Animal Form and Function, Mayer on Animal Species and Evolution, Lambert's Journal of the American Scientific Affiliation, Barker from the World Science Review, Waddington from the Evolution of Life, Boyden from the Scientific American, Wells from the Science of Life, Archer from Nature, Workman from Scientific American, McNair from the Globe and Mail, Cloud from Silence, Silence, Clark from the Work Discovery, Nelson from Synthetic Art Building, Wentworth from the Thoroughbred Racing Stock, and DeBear from Archipoteryx Lithographia. Then if you don't have enough, we'll give you some more. A theological seminar of the year, we're dealing with the doctrines of the Word of God, the theology of the book. If there's one thing that book never taught, or implied was so, it was the conjecture of drug maniacs who thought they came from animals. That is one doctrine that is absolutely foreign to the theological teaching of any verse in either testament. Every Bible-believing person in that book and out of that book is a creationist, like the Lord Jesus Christ, who said in the beginning, God created them, and he made them male and female. There is no such thing as evolution taught in one single book in the Bible by one single writer. Therefore, in a theological seminar of the year that is dealing primarily with Bible doctrine, it is relevant and germane to the discussion and paramount to the discussion for us to point out to you the fact that there are in this world hundreds of scientists who think the theory of evolution is a communist pipe dream given to you for the purpose of turning you into a sensual worshiping, materialistic, carnal slave to animal passions to be controlled by the state. We'll talk about this more on our next broadcast. Until then, may the Lord bless you and good day.